Secretary in the Ministry of Defense Production, Pakistan. After retirement, he was appointed Ambassador of Pakistan to Mauritius, Madagascar, Seychelles, and Comoros, Ambassador Razavis. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Noor. Uh, first of all, I, I take this opportunity to welcome our guests from uh, Ukraine. Uh, welcome to Mr. Petro, uh, who is Executive Director of uh, ILCO. Uh, General Zahid Mubashir is there online. He has been Pakistan's ambassador in Ukraine. Also welcome His Excellency Ambassador Vladimir Lakovov. And on my left side, I would be honored to introduce uh, General Vajahat Mufti. He has been also ambassador in Ukraine for uh, about two years or more. Uh, we also welcome Dr. Maria. Dr. Faranaz is here from uh, NUST. Uh, Dr. Olina, thank you for being here. And we will be joined by Dr. Ashfaq also. He is Principal School of Social Sciences and Humanity, NAST. Uh, thank you for all being here. Actually, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine that began in February 22 has had very far-reaching effects, especially it had implications for global security and energy. Russia and Ukraine are major exporters of oil and gas and also wheat and barley. Uh, I have the figures with me in front of me. The global wheat exports are about 29% from both the countries, sunflower oil 52%. And because of the Ukraine-Russia conflict, the prices of these commodities have risen a lot. Uh, more than 50% rise has been taken, uh, rise has been experienced in the price of natural gases, uh, in the price of oil, price of natural gas has doubled. And similarly, uh, the UN figures about the food commodities are that it has surged 20% since February 2022. These issues and other issues uh, we'll be discussing today with this brief uh, introduction and welcome. I hand you over back to Noor. Thank you so much, Ambassador Raza, for your wonderful remarks. I now welcome Petro Bakovsky, the Executive Director of the Ilko Kushiriv Democratic Initiatives Foundation, DIF. Before joining DIF, Petro Bakovsky worked for 14 years in the National Institute for Strategic Studies as head of the Center for Advanced Russian Studies. His areas of expertise include history, constitutional law, energy politics, and international relations. Mr. Petro, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, Dr. Raza Muhammad, Salam Alaikum, distinguished speakers, honorable guests. My dearest greetings to you from Kyiv. Democratic Initiative Foundations are honored to co chair this event together with Islamabad Policy Research Institute. Today, we are here to listen carefully to each other and to address very important topics of food and energy security. The reason which I see crucial for our dialogue is that both Ukraine and Pakistan play a stabilizing role in their region, namely Europe and South Asia. This role cannot be imagined without a strong national sovereignty participation in the networks of multilateral partnerships and a national vision of balance between interests of bigger global powers. Before I briefly look at how food and energy security shape each of the mentioned elements, I want to draw your attention to the key challenges and changes brought by the Russian aggression and multiple crises it highlighted. Well, every war in the essence is the result of miscalculation. Russia failed to assess strengths of the Ukraine's resilience and the European unity. European Union and NATO failed to see early warning signs of growing Russian assertiveness and hostility toward them. Ukraine 
Ukraine expected that early successes can contain aggression and force Russia into negotiations. The United States misinterpreted Russian nuclear threat and Russian readiness to engage with Iran and Northern Korea. And finally, China misperceived Russian military might and strategic thinking. Now, every big player, which I mentioned, must rethink its views of the others and of the global issues. Meanwhile, the, mi the middle emerging powers like Ukraine and Pakistan must learn more quickly from these crises, which were provoked by the current war. So first, the national sovereignty demands strong state intervention into economy. But the national government must do everything to support not only domestic defense industries, but also encourage private businesses which create domestic food and energy markets. Our Ukrainian experience proved that it is private national business, independent from the government, can find the best ways to stabilize markets and prepare them for likely shocks even in case of war. The role of the government is to create favorable conditions for monetary, financial, and banking stability, build strategic partnership with countries which are export and import destination. Second, modern technology and science are key for survival. Therefore, their development must be the ultimate goal of multilateral partnerships. It is even more important to diversify technologies that help to produce and transport food and energy than to balance sources of import of food and energy. And the national survival in the long term will depend on whether the nation is a part of projects that discover, test, and introduce new technologies in defense, biology and energy, and cyber sectors, and can protect them from hostile theft. Third, it is not wise, in my opinion, to count on the alliance with the single major power. Our war with Russia showed then on, that only a coalition of major, middle, and small states can be a reliable collective response to the common external threats to security. The nation, which accounts for less than 2% of global GDP, cannot prevail in confrontation with the alliance of powers, which represent more than 30% of global GDPs. At this point, I would like to say that I am looking forward to today's presentations, expert insights, and I hope that it will provide us with interesting ideas how Ukraine and Pakistan can build trust, enhance bilateral cooperation, and join efforts to address global issues of mutual concern. I believe that today's discussion will pave the way for the future joint events. Thank you. Thank you so much for your remarks, sir. Let us now begin the discussion in which our worthy speakers will share their insights on the impacts of Russia-Ukraine conflict on food and energy security. For perspectives from Pakistan, let me invite His Excellency Zahid Mubashir Sheikh, former ambassador of Pakistan to Ukraine. Assalamu alaikum to everyone. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege for me to participate in this webinar. It's a great initiative taken by Islamabad Policy Research Institute and DIF from Ukraine on the important subject of impact of Russia-Ukraine conflict on the food security and energy security of the nations. I had the honor of representing Pakistan in Ukraine for two years, from November 2018 to November 2020. Before I give my perspective of uh, Pakistan-Ukraine relations, uh, let me pay rich tributes to the brave Ukrainian nation 
for blunting the Russian onslaught with unparalleled courage and bravery. The Russians and most of the other people thought that Russian forces will roll over Ukraine within a matter of few weeks. The international media was referring to a 150 kilometers long armored column heading towards Kyiv. Most of the people thought Ukrainian forces were heavily outnumbered and the country was being led by a soft president whom people knew as a comedian TV actor. However, it was not to happen. The resilient Ukrainian nation never allowed this armored column to enter its capital. The soft image president today stands tall as the wartime president of Ukraine and his military style olive green shirt has become an icon of bravery. The country may have been partially destroyed, but a brave nation has been born. Now coming to the relations between Pakistan and Ukraine, let me uh, start by saying that our relations actually have been very limited, much less than the potential that the two, the two countries have. Our relations have been mostly restricted to the purchase of military hardware from Ukraine and at times uh, purchase of, of wheat from Ukraine. And, and, uh, and uh, as far as exports of Pakistan are concerned, they have been very limited. Textile, uh, medical instruments, and some fruits and vegetables. However, the potential is much more. We could have done much better. And there are, there are factors which, which have, you know, not allowed us to increase the, these relations. Our business remained under $100 million except the year in which we purchased our main battle tank from Ukraine. There are many factors which kept our export and import to, to, such, a, to such a limited extent. First is the distance of thousands of miles between the two countries and the trans transportation involved and the administrative difficulties that are faced by the businessmen. Secondly, we have had little geopolitical interdependence. Till this war, we all thought that we are, we are not really interdependent. But this war has brought a lot of change, which I will elaborate a little later. I have always claimed that Pakistan has had a major role in the independence of Ukraine. Had USSR not been defeated in Afghanistan, it would not have been disintegrated and Pakistan had a major role in the defeat of USSR in <clears throat> Afghanistan. It looks unbelievable that not a single high-level visit of foreign office or at national level took place during my tenure, my two years, and many years before that. Only military-related visits took place. A delegation from HIT would come, weapon and uh, equipment uh, people would come, inspect the equipment, buy some equipment, and that is all. Not a single visit at diplomatic level. From the foreign office, during my two years, not even a section officer visited Ukraine. You know, visiting solves a lot of problems. If you visit each other, talk to each other, many problems are solved. So as a result, there have been problems of visa, there have been problems of banking, banking transactions. Even we as diplomats had a lot of problems in, in, in sending money to Pakistan. So what would actually a businessman do? So it was very difficult. So unless you have visits at foreign office level, at diplomatic level, at political level, 
the the problems do not get solved during my time only significant visit that was there that was of chief of air staff who visited ukraine and uh, and his visit was reciprocated soon after my departure general bajwa the chief of army staff also visited ukraine but that visit was also a somewhat a, of a private nature and uh, it was never reciprocated the first time that we have seen a high level visit from ukraine is the visit of the foreign minister in 2022 july i think and which has had a significant uh, significant uh, effect on our relation he he had met the foreign minister he had met the prime minister so i think things stand to move forward and a realization has also been made that it is not only pakistan which is dependent on equipment from ukraine now today we feel that ukraine also needs something from pakistan so this is the realization that should have come much earlier and as as uh, was highlighted by by the uh, uh, president of the foundation the executive director of the foundation mr barkowski that all the nations are independent are interdependent you know the 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 effect of russia russia's war on ukraine has been felt throughout the world ukraine has been a, a producer of wheat you know producing and supplying wheat to many countries of the world then russia has been the source of power the source of energy for the europe so all all the equation has been disturbed so inter interdependence must be realized before it is stopped <clears throat> i am glad that after the outbreak of the war between russia and ukraine both countries have realized the importance of each other it may have been it may be by chance but the presence of the then prime minister uh, mr imran khan in russia on the night the attack was launched you know has introduced both countries to each other in a big way subsequently the visit of uh, ukrainian foreign minister like i said has had a lot of positive effect and now i think we need to have a fresh look at the relations between the two countries and and we need to talk to each other we need to have visits we need to have agreements we need to make the visa easier and i tell you these two countries they are they are technologically both these countries are as good as any advanced country of the world we have been able to make a nuclear weapon ourselves ukraine is ukraine is giving us tanks they make tanks so what is stopping us from collaborating with each other with each other if these two countries collaborate and uh, complement each other's resources we can make civilian aircraft we can make uh, military aircraft we can make tanks together and 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 many uh, all types of automobiles we can make together we can make our own cars we are we are still dependent on japan for cars you know every and and we are importing from china i i find no reason why if these two countries collaborate and have joint ventures why we cannot make uh, all these things ourselves then in the field of education we stand to gain from each other especially pakistan stands to gain from ukraine during my tenure in ukraine there were just about 3 to 400 students studying the medical or engineering in ukraine whereas india had about 12000 students my my mission was to increase it but unfortunately then the corona came and then the war started so it hasn't really progressed but we must look into future and we must uh, provide uh, we must exchange of students exchange of teachers education is one field which will which will not only help both the countries it will bring us closer to each other if we have people educated from ukraine and people educated from pakistan then the uh, interaction becomes much easier therefore i think that these two countries are very important countries of the world 
and if they collaborate with each other irrespective of their relationships with the other countries we stand to gain i'm sure this webinar is a is a uh, one of the first steps towards that and i compliment both these organizations ipri and dif for organizing this thank you very much Very insightful indeed. Let us move to Ukrainian perspective by His Excellency, Ambassador Vladimir Lekhimov, former ambassador of Ukraine to Pakistan. Once again, Dobro Horanku, Assalamu Alaikum, very good morning to everybody. I'm happy to address participants of this discussion. Special warm greetings to Pakistani colleagues. After almost three years since I completed my mission in your amazing, beautiful country and where I have a lot of good friends in Islamabad and many parts of the country. Ukraine and Pakistan enjoy traditionally friendly, mutually beneficial and constructive relations. Their active engagement in political, military and technical trade and humanitarian domains is complemented with successful interaction on multilateral stage. Ukrainian-Pakistani relations had started long before the official recognition by Pakistan of Ukraine's independence in late December 1991 and establishing diplomatic relations in March 1992. Back in 1960, 1970s, Ukrainian specialists contributed to development of key industries of national economy of Pakistan in particular to construction of the Pakistani steel mills in Karachi, hydroelectric plants in Tarbela, Kalabakh. And of course, the contract concluded in 1996 with Ukraine for supply of 320 T-80 UD tanks ensured the strength of the Pakistani army for decades to come. At the peak of the grain crisis in 2020, Ukrainian traders covered two sets of the grain deficit in Pakistan, exporting more than 1.2 million tons of wheat to the country. Thus, Ukraine has proved to be a guarantor of Pakistan's food security. This year, we had a telephone conversation between our presidents in February and July, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Dmitro Kuleba held a visit to Pakistan that invigorated strong and deeply rooted ties between our countries. Cooperation between the two countries is based on mutual values. In July 2023, Ukraine supported the resolution of the 53rd session of the United Human Rights Council. It's called Countering Religious Hatred, constitu Constituting constituting incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence, tabled by Pakistan on behalf of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Ukraine voted for the resolution based on convictions that insulting any religious feeling is unacceptable and should be condemned. High-level mutual understanding between Ukraine and Pakistan, along with successful interaction in military, technical, trade, and economic domains, provide favorable conditions for further development of mutual, mutually beneficial cooperation between the two countries. And agriculture is one of the most important and promising areas of our cooperation. It came to my mind to demonstrate you the joint postal stamp of Pakistan and Ukraine we issued together with Pakistani colleagues during my first year of the mission to your country. I will try right now, sorry to put it on the screen, just a moment. Okay. Yes, you, you can see, could see it. Hello. Yes, yes, we can see. Thank you so much, yes. We've got two editions of this stamp. Ukrainian and Pakistani, this is a Pakistani edition. It dedicated to two ancient civilizations which put the foundation of our modern states. They are Mohenjo-Daro 
or Indus Valley civilization on the terrain of Pakistan and civilization of Tripilia in Ukraine. This stamp has become very popular in both countries, not only among the philatelists. I remember when showing this stamp during my meeting with Pakistani students in Islamabad University and speaking about roots of our friendship, a Pakistani young man said that our relations perhaps started not 50 or 70 years ago, but 5000 BC because of many similarities between these two ancient civilizations. Both archaeological sites had been remarkable areas for ancient world agriculture. Many experts and historians call them the cradles of agriculture of humanity. And that is, of course, no coincidence that we started our discussion on this topic. But let's come back to our today's world. We know, you know, that one of the key elements of Russian war against Ukraine, among other crimes, are brutal attacks against Ukrainian ports and deliveries of grain into the world market and to the countries which need them most. These countries were put by Russians at the age of surviving, at the age of abyss of hunger of their people. Insidious policy of Russian in using famine as a weapon against human beings is one of the tools practiced not once in their history. According to the British Guardian, human rights lawyers working with Ukraine's public prosecutor are preparing a war crimes dossier to submit to International Criminal Court, accusing Russia of deliberately causing starvation during the 18th month, month long conflict. The aim of is to document instances where Russian invaders used hunger as a weapon of war, providing evidence to the ICC to launch the first prosecution of its kind that would indict the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Yusuf Khan, a senior lawyer uh, with law firm Global Rights Compliance, said the weaponization of food by aggressors has taken place in three phases, starting with the initial invasion where Ukrainian cities were besieged and food supplies cut. Among many documented cases, investigators are focusing on the siege of Mariupol, Han added. Food supplies were cut to the city and humanitarian relief corridors blocked or bombed, making it very difficult or impossible to desperate starving civilians to escape. The second phase includes destruction of food and water supplies, as well as energy sources across Ukraine during the fighting, which the lawyer described as an objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population. Such a text, Mr. Hahn argued, were not crimes of result, but crimes of intent. Because if you are taking out objects that civilians need, like energy, infrastructure, or food, in the dead of winter, there is a forcibility to your actions. Cities like cities uh, such as Mykolaiv in the south were left without drinking water from early in the conflict after Russian forces captured the pumping stations that supplied it. The third element of Russian attempts to prevent or restrict expo exports of Ukrainian food. We've seen Russia attack grain facilities on the Danube and engage in muscle flexing on the Black Sea. According to the reports from Ukrainian officials, 270,000 tons of the foodstuff were destroyed only in late July and early August. Fresh accusations that Russia sought to starve Ukrainians are particularly emotive in the light of history. In 1932, 1933, millions of Ukrainians died in, of hunger in the Holodomor and forced famine engineered by Joseph Stalin's Soviet government. The crime of, of the Holodomor had been condemned already by many countries and international organizations. But they have been given a renewed emphasis after the passage of United Nations Security Council resolution in 2018, 
which condemns the use of starvation as a weapon of war and revisions to the ICC's governing Rome Statute in 2090 to explain the type of cases that can be brought. Global rights compliance is working with Ukrainian prosecutors to compile the special dossier. The intention is to make a filing under Article 15 of the Rome Statute, allowing said parties to send information on alleged war crimes to the ICC prosecutor. We strongly hope this will add a new arrest warrant to a military criminal by name of Putin. But also to brief some optimistic news. I want to inform that recently Ukrainian vessels loaded with grain restarted their way through the Black Sea ports to their destination. The great initiative, train initiative is moving forward without Russia and despite Russia aggression. And another piece of good news, God blessed us with the harvest of grains and oil seeds that exceed last year figures. More detailed information may be received from our experts later. And at the conclusion of my expose, I want to thank all my Pakistani friends and colleagues for their solidarity and support. We'll never forget. Mayor Bani, Slava Ukraini, Pakistan Zindabad, Ukraine, Pakistan, Dosti, Payindabad. Thank you so much, Excellency. Invite His Excellency Ambassador Major General Vijahat Mufti, former ambassador of Pakistan to Ukraine. We are very happy to have him in person with us at IPRI today. Let us hear his thoughts on the impacts of Russia-Ukraine conflict on global supply chains. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. My greetings to all my friends from uh, Ukraine, especially uh, His Excellency Lokomov. I am seeing you, sir, after about three, four years' time, rather a little more than that. No. Ladies and gentlemen, in the next 10 minutes or so, I am going to talk about the Russia-Ukraine conflict and its impact on the world supply chains. Historically, the first supply chain started with the move of slaves from Africa to Caribbean to grow sugarcane, which was brought from India, and it ended up in the distilleries of USA. The term supply chain is attributed to the newspaper, the Independent, which referred to the concept of network of suppliers, producers, manufacturers, and consumers in 1905. However, the term supply chain had been around for a long time, much before that. There are four kinds of participants in every supply chain. They perform the activities that make a supply chain work and provide uh, reasons for it to exist. These participants are producers, distributors or wholesalers, retailers, customers, and consumers. The supply chain encompasses a broad range of activities, including sourcing, manufacturing, transporting, and selling physical goods and services. Now, a few words about the Russia-Ukraine conflict. As we all know that on 24 February 22, Russia invaded Ukraine. In fact, the crisis had started in 2014 when Russia in the aftermath of a revolution when Russia in the aftermath of a revolution in Ukraine took over Crimea and declared two provinces, that is Donbas, Donetsk and Luhansk of Ukraine as independent. They are commonly known as Donbas. I happened to be there at that point in time and witness the initial developments of this crisis. Much before that, in 2005, after the Orange Revolution, Ukraine decided to obtain full membership of EU. From day one, Russia was opposed to the idea of Ukrainian joining EU due to its own security concerns. On 21st November 2013, just two days before signing the agreement with the EU, the then pro-Russian president, Mr. Yanukovych, announced that Ukraine would not join the EU. It resulted in a large-scale protest by the people of Ukraine 
and thousands of Ukrainians gathered in Maidan, commonly known as Euro Maidan, and it was just like the Harir Square of Egypt. The sitting of these people continued, and on 20th February 2014, secret police of Ukraine, known as Parkat, under the influence of Russia, assaulted the peaceful protesters, resulting in the death of 21 unarmed protesters. There were large scale disturbances in the country, which forced President Yanukovych to flee the country and a pro-EU revolutionary government was installed. To date, the process of joining the EU by Ukraine has not been completed. On 20th February 2014, Russia, following the events in Ukraine, occupied Crimea. The Russian Black Sea Fleet had nearly 50 warships, seven submarines, and many support vessels, undermining the capability of Ukrainian Navy in Black Sea. Just after the annexation of Crimea, Russia dominated the Black Sea and laid a siege to the southern naval base of Ukraine in Black Sea. The siege continued for 24 days and ended up with the capture of 13 Ukrainian naval ships by Russia. That way, Ukrainian was deprived almost of 80% of its naval power. Thereafter, the conflict kept simmering for a few years. And finally, on 24 February 22, Russia invaded Ukraine, escalating the Russo-Ukrainian conflict to a full-scale war. The invasion has been described as the biggest attack on a European country since the Second World War and has killed tens and thousands of people on both sides. Ukraine is, has borders with Belarus in the north, Russia to the east, the Sea of Azov and Black Sea in the south, Moldova and Romania to the southwest, and Hungary, Slovakia, and Poland to the west. The total geographical area of Ukraine is 6 lakh 3,700 square kilometers. The land border of Ukraine is 6,993 kilometers. The Ukrainian population stood at 45 million in 2014, and Ukraine has been suffering from a negative population growth rate due to the one-child policy when it was part of Soviet Union. Since the start of conflict, 7 million people, 7 million people have been forced to migrate the country due to the security situation. And today, due to the high migration rate, Ukrainian population stacked at 37 million. The negative factor can have an impact on the defense of the country and also to operate the supply chains affecting the, uh, in the, effectively in the complex environment as of today. More than 55% of Ukrainian land is arable. Agriculture produced are Ukraine's most important exports. It counts for 41% of the country's 60 billion overall export trade. Ukraine exports mainly steel, coal, fuel, and petroleum products, chemicals and transport equipment, and grain like barley, corn, and chemicals, and transport equipment and, uh, to other countries. More than 60% of the export goes to the other former Republic, Soviet Republic countries, like Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus, and some other countries include Turkey and China. Ukraine's main export to the EU are, EU are cereals, oil seeds, animals, and vegetable fats, and oil, iron, and steel. In 1922, Ukraine overtook the US as the third biggest source of EU agri-food imports. Ukraine produces one third of the world's sunflower oil and accounts for nearly half of the global exports. Ukraine has four means of transportation to support its supply chain effort. That includes, like any other country, rail, road, sea, and the air. Total length of railway track is 21,640 kilometers, out of which 9,870 kilometers is electrified. The railway track is mostly old, which restricts the train speed in certain sectors. It has different gauge vis-a-vis -vis the European railways system, creating problem for integration of European railways with the Ukrainian railways. Ukraine and EU have made an elaborated plan to address this issue but it requires a huge amount of money and time. The plan is held up due to war in the region. 
Total length of road network is in Ukraine is 1,69,694 kilometers. Most of the roads are single and not in very good condition. There are 28 national highways in Ukraine with a total length of 9,331 kilometers. Seaports lay a major role in the export market of Ukraine. The Black Sea coast is home of around 65 seaports that contribute to the economic prosperity of the region, making the Black Sea one of the busiest trade routes in the world. Six countries border the Black Sea, including Ukraine to the north, Russia and Georgia to the east, Turkey to the south, Bulgaria and Romania to the west. Ukraine has 18 seaports along the coastline of Black Sea and Sea of Azov. Largest seaport of Ukraine are Pivdeni, Odessa, Mykolaiv, and Kromosrov, which counts for about 80% of the total Ukrainian seaports. Out of these, the port of Odessa is the largest Ukrainian seaport in the Black Sea with an annual traffic capacity of 40 million tons. Russia and Ukraine exported 34% of the world wheat before the war, and 90% of that wheat was exported through sea. Ukraine's infrastructure industry has been drastically weakened by Russian invasion. Substantive infrastructure activity is unlikely to take place until the conflict is over. And this conflict is not likely to end soon. Today, Ukraine's infrastructure market is the smallest in the region in terms of value. The conflict has brought about disrupted supply chains and shortage of raw materials. Russia has attacked Odessa, the main port of Ukraine, several times and struck the grain storage facilities at the port. Hundreds of ships laden with wheat and corn kept stranded at Ukrainian port due to war, leading to having an impact on the supply chains all over the world. Apart from Odessa, Mariupol, another important port city of Ukraine, was attacked by Russia, and it suffered a damage of almost 90% of its city infrastructure. The war has severely affected the Ukrainian economy. The blockade of Ukrainian ports in the Black Sea and has a major impact on traditional sea-based supply chains worldwide. Till December 22, the total amount of documented damage to Ukrainian infrastructure is estimated at $137.8 billion. From February 22 till August 22, the supply chain through sea were standstill, causing food prices to rise globally and making it impossible to keep the supply chains operative in many countries of Africa, Asia, and even Europe. To make the supply chains operative, Turkey, Russia, Ukraine, and the UN launched a Black Sea Grain Initiative, known as BSG. The BSG initiative allowed exports of several Black Sea ports, or export from several Black Sea ports, including Odessa. The implementation of BSG was facilitated by the Joint Coordination Center, which was located in Istanbul, which guided cargo ships from the Black Sea ports into international waters, avoiding mined area through a safe maritime corridor. Apart from BSG, EU and Ukraine developed a concept of solidarity lanes to facilitate Ukraine's agriculture export and bilateral trade with the EU. It was an action plan to establish alternate routes of Ukrainian exports via rail, road, and inland waterways. These ran through Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia. The BSC initiative, combined with the existing EU solidarity lanes, made it possible to export more than 25 million tons of grain. Though BSC had hiccups due to Russia's negative behavior and had to be discontinued frequently. Despite the deal, Russia attacked Odessa seaport with cruise missiles hours after signing of the deal. As of today, the BSG is still not operative because of Russia's negative attitude, because these are not cooperating and letting the uh, ships of Ukraine enter into the ports. A lot of natural gas, gas supply for Europe comes from the Nord Stream pipeline out of Russia, 
which is now which is limiting the supply. The uncertainty due to the conflict had a snowball effect on the supply chain across the globe. Europe, in Europe, natural gas prices rose by around 130% since the war started, while coal prices rose to about 97% during the same period. The conflict also disrupted the supply chains of US. The war restricted the supply of key metals such as platinum, titanium, and nickel from Russia. Though these are no longer available, shortage of these elements has disrupted the production of important goods. The Ukraine conflict has sig significantly impacted air freight, with many airlines suspending or reducing flights to the region. This has led to higher air freight rates and longer delivery times for goods shipped to to and from Ukraine. Gentlemen, to conclude, I would like to say that the Russo-Ukrainian conflict, if continued, will be a disaster for the world supply chains and world powers must intervene to ensure the end of the conflict as early as possible. At the end, I would like to appreciate the resilience of Ukrainian people and Ukrainian army. And I would like to state here that before uh, the one day before the Russian attack uh, Ukraine, we had a discussion and a seminar in uh, Strategic Institute of Pakistan. And there probably a uh, consensus opinion was that if Russia attacked, probably it would be difficult for Ukrainian army and the people to face the onslaught. But my uh, congratulations and appreciation for the people of Ukraine who have stood against the might of a Russian onslaught and it also gives us a lesson to Pakistan, which is also has a much larger neighbor from Pakistan's own military perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. Let us now proceed to the next session, where our worthy participants shall share their analysis on the impact of Russia-Ukraine conflict on food security. It is politely requested that all our worthy speakers remain mindful of our time constraints. For, for Ukraine perspective, we are happy to have with us Dr. Maria Boganos, head of the Center for Food and Land Use Research, Kiev School of Economics. She specializes in agriculture and trade policies impacts analysis, agriculture market projections and modeling. Dr. Maria, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, dear hosts, dear guests, it's a pleasure and it's an honor for me to present uh, at this webinar at this event. Uh, let me move to my presentation immediately. All right. Okay, I hope you can see it. Uh, I will not be able to see anyone uh, on the screen. Uh, today, I would like to talk about our agricultural sector, about the Ukrainian agricultural sector, about, about its uh, specificities, uh, about its strengths, and also about its challenges and the lessons we have already learned and we keep learning as the war is unfortunately uh, still ongoing. Uh, some background information here on the slide, you can see two maps. Uh, in the left top corner, there is a map with the current uh, state of the offenses of where the battles are taking place. So everything which is, um, I'm sorry, which is in red uh, are occupied by Russia and here at the borders are uh, intensive battles taking place. Uh, everything here in blue on the north and the northeast of the country and a little bit uh, on the south are the liberated territories. And here on the bottom, there is a map of the planting progress, uh, which was observed in 2022, not 2023. Uh, for spring crops and for winter crops. Uh, this is the picture from the satellite uh, from the company called uh, Harvest. And here you can see that most, I mean, by far the most part of the entire Ukrainian territory uh, are being cultivated with cereals winter or summer. And also we can see that 
in 2022, the farmers, the agricultural producers that have been under the occupation continued cultivating and sowing. Overall, Ukraine has a very large agricultural area. This is almost 43 million hectares. More than 30 million hectares are arable land, which is a land where we can grow cereals and oil seeds. And if you compare this uh, to the farmland in Europe, you can see that Ukraine's arable area is by far larger than the land in other European countries. Uh, the previous speaker, uh, thank you very much, has given uh, as well a very good overview of what Ukraine produces and how much it exports. Overall, 50% of global exports of sunflower oil are from Ukraine. 10% of wheat global exports are also from Ukraine and 15% of barley and corn. Um, our major buyers of agricultural produce are China, Egypt, also European Union. Uh, however, by crop, there will be a diversification of the importers. So for example, the wheat is mostly sold to the Middle East and North African countries. The corn uh, is mostly sold to China and uh, our major uh, importer of sunflower oil are uh, European Union countries. As regards domestic uh, supply, Ukraine supplies uh, completely its population with staple crops, vegetables and meat uh, as well supplied by Ukrainian producers by more than 80%. That is to say, uh, Ukraine is very self, has very self-sufficient uh, in terms of its food. It has been so uh, before the war and it continues to be so also as the war is ongoing. Um, Ukrainian agricultural sector and its characteristics, they have uh, been discovered by the world with the, with the start of the war and to a big surprise, because the agricultural producers, in particular crop producers, came out as a very strong and resilient group of producers. And here I would like to look a little bit into um, some of the major characteristics of what has been going on uh, before the war, a little bit historically. So as you have seen um, on the map and with the agricultural land, Ukraine is naturally equipped for agricultural production, both crops and livestock. And livestock. We have a lot of arable land. We have also uh, land for uh, grazing of livestock. In some, somewhere in the beginning of 2000s, all major governmental interventions into the markets, into the agriculture, markets were over. Before that, we had export taxes, some export prohibitions. Uh, there was a, many changes going on from year to year about the agricultural policy. But in the beginning of the 2000s, the interventions, major ones were over. The agricultural policy were more or less stabilized, which together with relatively low production costs, gave a major push for the Ukrainian producers and for the sector uh, to, to establish itself and to develop, especially with regard to the export-oriented crops. Um, that is to say, the market environment, relatively free, allowed the sector to, um, to discover its strengths and develop. At the same time, our agricultural land, as you have seen, a very large area, was by 25% owned by public companies and 75% was privately owned. However, the privately owned land, as well as public, could not be sold. Uh, thus, agricultural producers, they 
owned a little bit of land if they inherited it from their um, predecessors, grandparents, and so on. And they also had to lease if they wanted to grow. With all these conditions, the agricultural sector has developed into being a very, uh, very diversified, as you can see on this next slide. So for example, uh, on the right, you will see the two bars where in the total number of enterprises, 57% are less than 100 hectares. This is small for Ukraine. And then we have uh, larger ones from 100 to 200, which takes 12% of the total number and so on. However, the largest ones, which are more than 3000 hectares produce around 30% of the agricultural production. So uh, the larger ones produce a larger share. However, it's one third and the rest of the agricultural produce is produced by the rest smaller producers. We have as well developed several types of organizational forms uh, and as well um, forms that are registered for uh, taxpayers. So there are uh, those which are, which are called private entrepreneurs. There are those that are called uh, companies, which uh, some of them also listed on the European exchanges. Um, households, they still produce agricultural production and um, over 30% 30 30 of the total agricultural output is actually produced by the households, which is uh, a few cows, maybe one or two, and less than a hectare of land. Um, the agricultural export corridors, uh, this is the status of August. Uh, we already do not have access to, to the seaports, and which means that the major um, share of the agricultural export currently are going through the river ports and through the through the uh, northwestern borders uh, where we have Poland. Uh, the river ports have become extremely important. If in the beginning of the war, that is March, April uh, 2022, May 2022, the capacity uh, of the ports to transport agricultural production was up to 1 million tons per month. Uh, by July 2023, this capacity uh, grew to 2.8 million tons. Um, this is because uh, the Ukrainian producers had to explore all of the exporting possibilities because the shipments from the ports that were open during the grain deal uh, were slow for them. So they wanted to speed the process and uh, together with the European Union's partners developed alternative routes. Um, Yes, here on the graph, uh, you can see that the ports still play, continued in 2022 and 2023 to play the major role in agricultural exports of Ukraine, as you have heard uh, from uh, the previous speaker. However, now that the grain deal is over, uh, this uh, picture is not more in place. Uh, what is the lesson regarding our logistics? Uh, diversification. And this lesson will be going uh, through the entire presentation. Diversification is very important. We have been focused on the Black Sea ports so much, and that was a very important tar target for Russia, because as soon as they uh, blocked the ports, Ukraine suffered, Ukrainian agriculture and Ukraine suffered uh, tremendous uh, economic losses. Uh, another aspect is, of course, uh, customs procedures and infrastructure compatibility. Uh, due, in this diversification um, initiative, we have to consider uh, that there will be differences between infrastructure uh, that is on the side of the Ukraine and on the side of our neighbors. For example, this example of the rail gauge between Ukraine and the EU. There is another aspect 
which considers um, non-trade uh, barriers very important. This is quality standards. Uh, if we want uh, to expand to different markets, more commodities, for example, processed commodities, in order to reduce the uh, amount and to increase the value, we also have to consider the uh, quality differences and uh, all of the non-trade barriers. So this is a work for the trade negotiations, which is also very important now for Ukraine and will continue post-war. Storage. All storage capacities have as well been uh, located the, the biggest, the, the biggest of, the last of them, most of them were located to the south which has become as well a very easy target uh, for the Russians, which means that our storage infrastructure has to be decentralized. It has to be to be well protected um, and it has to be also located in um, uh, spread more all over the country. Um, as regard to the food security and food affordability, in Ukraine. Uh, you can see below on the graph the food inflation, uh, the red line. The red line shows that with the beginning of the war, the food inflation, this is increase in the prices for food, was tremendous. But then uh, by August 2023, uh, it returned more or less to the pre-war level. And this is uh, thanks to the international aid and to the bank bank policy and public policies that has been uh, in place to reduce the prices. Uh, we have as well uh, estimated the food affordability index, which is a function of food prices and income of the people. And of course, the affordability uh, dropped from 15% to 43% as compared to the pre-war times. And we have as well identified the food security markers for the Ukrainian households. Thus, despite Ukraine continues uh, to be self-sufficient in food because it still produces a lot, independently on that, of that, there are households that do not have access to um, regular uh, nutritious, healthy food. And these households, uh, are characterized by the following uh, features. They are located in active combat zones, which means nothing can get to them uh, from the uh, from the uh, from the Ukrainian side, where there are no combat zones, and also that inside those zones they have uh, difficulties in accessing the food. So this not about agriculture this is uh, about com about combating yeah uh, the second uh, characteristic is that it is a female led household meaning that it is probably uh, only uh, only a woman there is no uh, man so it's a a one-person-led household with a lower income. So potentially, we have not looked at it yet in more detail, but there is maybe potentially hiding a uh, difference in um, salaries between men and women in Ukraine and accessibility to different types of jobs. The third one is a, in the household, there are socially vulnerable me members present. The household is internally displaced and uh, they are not engaged in agriculture. So as soon as a household does not have anything to cultivate, either a small garden or land, uh, they, are, they are becoming uh, less food secure in Ukraine and also a household which has a financial debt. Um, on the, my last slide, uh, I would like to point out that um, there are eight. There have been established eight channels uh, for the agricultural producers. So currently, the producers which need additional support or aid register in state agrarian registry, uh, and from that registry, they can access uh, different types of supports that have existed and currently exist in Ukraine. 
informational awareness of the producers is very important. Uh, as well, uh, the agricultural producers in Ukraine are very well organized. We have more than 20 agricultural producer associations that are politically active, which means that uh, they participate, they uh, try to lobby the interests of, of the agricultural sector, provide analysis to policy makers, deliver the information, the status quo of the agricultural sector and raise awareness in general over what is going on um, with the agricultural sector and also awareness of the agricultural producers. At this point, I would like to thank you very much for your time. Uh, and in case there will be any questions, I would be uh, happy to answer them. Dr. Maria, this was very insightful indeed. For perspectives from Pakistan, let us hear now from Dr. Faranaz, Assistant Professor, Department of Government and Public Policy, National University of Science and Technology, NAST Islamabad. She also holds a PhD in radicalization and violent extremism from University of Sydney. Dr. Farah, please. Thank you very much. Um, I think after listening to uh, esteemed scholars, there is nothing much left for me in terms of food security. Uh, but what I do here is I will look into, um, like I will try to connect everything that they left for discussion. Um, Major General Bajahat, he kind of provided in-depth analysis to the rising food security and energy security after the Russia-Ukraine invasion and the war that is still going on. Um, I would say that um, the war itself, like any war, it's not a good thing to happen to anyone in their life. But when the war is taking place in, place in Russia and Ukraine, it is not only limited to the lives of the Russians and the Ukrainians and Europeans, but the rest of the world as well. The heat of the war is felt by people across the world in Africa, in Middle East, in Asia, in Europe, and of course, Russia and Ukrainian themselves as well. We could see that the um, basic definition of food security, which says that there should be um, uh, enough or sufficient quant uh, quantity of affordable nutri nutrient food available to the mankind. So the war is threatening even that aspect of, or that definition of food security, where there is ample food already there in Ukraine in terms of uh, the, the wheat, barley, and uh, Con that is that Ukraine is um, uh, is uh, is providing, but it is not able to supply it to to the rest of the world who are um, uh, in terms of their food security are um, not able to deal with that problem. So uh, the major role of um, uh, the food supply chains that we look after it revolves around several stages, and among those stages, which General Wajahad also highlighted the production, processing, handling, storage, retailing, consumption, all these things and these stages are crucial when it comes to food supply chains or food security at, uh, in, in, in all aspects. They're vital for both food safety and the manufacturing and the consumer ends as well. So in that context, if we look at Ukraine in particular, we are all very clear on that it is the fifth biggest exporter of wheat and uh, it fed around 400 million people a year. But unfortunately, post the Russia-Ukraine war, there the, the supplies, the supply chain or its um, uh, system has completely disrupted. It was about to like before the war, um, Ukraine was able to provide around forty-nine percent of uh, um, wheat to Somalia and around thirty-six point eight percent to Tunisia, and it used to export around six million tons of grains almost every month, though through its seaports. But with the war, what happens? The import or the export it dropped down to two hundred only, and it was not able to export the rest of the food. So I always uh, thought about what happened to the grains that is getting harvested in Ukraine, and uh, because they are, as mentioned by our esteemed scholars that Ukraine is an agri-based society and most of its uh, land is used for agricultural production. So the war changed everything. And the Russia blockaded the Ukraine coastline and controlled some of its coasts while uh, bombarded others also led towards you know, several problems for the agriculture side of it. 
they were um, there was nothing that is moving uh, from the seaports and the seaports are uh, are completely dysfunctional leading towards problems for storing that is the basic stage of um, the food supply chains the storage of the food is becoming an issue because there is the silos are already full so they are not able to store further and each year like last year and even this year uh, when there was this harvest season going on of course they had to harvest their their crop the wheat and the corn, but they were not able to take them to the market, leading towards a problem to store that food appropriately. So that was also the biggest issue that Ukraine is facing even till date. Along with that, uh, what happens is that there is an issue of paying the farmers as well, which is also leading towards severe problems for the Ukrainians to deal with the problem of sustaining with the food that they already have and also dealing with the supply chain issues as well. So uh, what happened is that they were the farmers, they, they, they definitely, if they're working in the farms, they need their salaries and their wages done. So paying back to their um, uh, employees, that was a biggest issue and still is an issue for the, U the Ukrainian state to deal with. There is not even enough manpower. One, they are, they do not, they cannot even provide wages. Secondly, there is not enough manpower leading towards high prices of the food that is taking place. And one way or the other, if the food is getting um, exported to other parts of the world um, through like the, the Turkey deal that was discussed over there, which never materialized even, but still the, the amount of food that is up there is getting wasted one way or the other. That is leading towards several problems and even the cost of the food is getting higher. So the, sec the third issue uh, that I can see over here is the loading and reloading of the wheat on the trains and on the trucks. So initially, uh, the routes that were used were the sea routes, which changed to, um, uh, to the land routes, like through trains and through trucks. So uh, this is a very long way to reach to the countries who need those supplies to be sorted out, leading to several problems for the people to deal with the issue. One, it is getting costly. Secondly, they are not able to deal with the with the problem in the right amount of time. So it is time consuming as well. So uh, the grains that is like the loading and reloading is becoming complex for Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians go on from 6 million tons of grain every month to just 200,000 in March 2022 last year, and which was about 1.2 million in 2021. Um, the actual numbers for the 2023 I have yet to come, but there is a lot of problems that is re revolving around it. The harvest season with no plans leading towards a declaration of food security. But can we sustain with this kind of environment where there is a lot of uh, countries who are um, uh, deprived of the basic, you know, the food that they require for their sustenance, like in the Middle East, in Africa, and in the rest of the world as well. If you look at the MENA region, they're heavily dependent on the Ukrainian and the Russian grains, wheat, corn, barley, repast, and sunflower oil. And according to the UN statistics and their reports of March 2022, Egypt dependence was 80%, Tunisia 80%, Lebanon 60%, China 23%, Turkey 26%, and India 13%. They were highly de depending on the grains getting imported from Russia and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. The food prices in April 2022 were 34% higher than last year. And some 45 million people in 38 countries are knocking on famine doors, according to the United Nations. So this is a serious problem that is happening over there. Along with that, um, there are several other issues, like the countries heavily dependent on the Ukraine food grain will be looking for alternative sources, like surging global inflation and global and export restriction will make the switching very expensive. And this is what we can see: life in Europe, life in in the UK, life in uh, in the Middle East, and in the rest of the world is getting very expensive to deal with. And countries like Egypt, Lebanon, Tunisia are highly vulnerable to rights famine and social unrest leading to political destabilization. Um, I must say it's the, the impact of the war um, on, the, on the countries is so stronger that per kilo of wheat um, in Pakistan last year, it was about 160 or something, which is getting higher even. So the cost of life is getting too stronger for the people to deal with. So it, it's, it's, it's not only limited to this part of the world, but everywhere else is getting affected with this war. 
Egypt, which is the world's largest importer of wheat, its import is a total of 12 to 13 million tons every year to feed 105 million population is getting affected. And the population of MENA region consume the highest wheat per capita, 128 kg is also getting affected. Russia, the world largest producer of fertilizer is not able to, uh, to export its fertilization, uh, fertilizers, et cetera. The higher prices for grain, energy, fertilizers, and transport in the midst of the aftermath of COVID were already threatening the food supplies for millions of people and driving hunger and inflation. But Russia-Ukraine war crisis has added fuel to the fire and people are not able to come out of the COVID pandem pandemic and yet they are meeting another conflict situation which is affecting the world at large. In many places like Africa, Middle East, Afghanistan, there are, there, there are simply no food reserves available where we can see that uh, Ukraine is not able to supply those reserves to the rest of the world. So why we are wasting food where we, where we are facing shortage of food everywhere. So people in the African countries are meeting the same fate. There is limited scope to replace imports from Ukraine while rising fuel and energy prices and the transport charges and the prices of is store, storing and refrigeration and the wheat market in particular and grain market in general will remain very tight uh, even this year. We have seen it was tighter in 2022, but this year is going to be much more tighter. So the United Nations itself facing difficulties in buying food grains for their relief operations in many parts of the world. And they are not able to supply food to all those um, countries in the developing world who are facing lots of difficulties in dealing with the food security problems and inflation and famine and all of that. So we need to find a resolve to all of this where we can see it's like everyone is getting affected with with the war from from ukraine to europe to russia to middle east to africa to southeast asia and to any any part of the world so there should be um uh, like a consensus based on that we need to have a resolve to the conflict as soon as possible otherwise the food security and and the and the inflation and the price hike will get unaffordable for the people to deal with i'll stop here due to the shortage of time and i'm open to questions thank you thank you professor uh, we are also open to receiving questions in the tag chat box by the participants in the next part of the session, our worthy participants will discuss the impacts of Russia-Ukraine conflict on the energy security. For a uh, Ukrainian perspective, let us hear from Dr. Olena Pavlenko, president and co-founder of DIXI Group, Kiev. She has worked in the energy sector for more than 70, uh, 17 years now, dealing with such issues as energy security, energy transparency, oil and gas market liberalization, EU, Ukraine, Russia, energy relations. Olena has served as an advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine and the Minister of Energy Ukraine also. Dr. Olena, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear honorable audience, uh, for the possibility to talk today on energy issues. And um, if I may, I will also share my screen and uh, start the presentation. Uh, Zoom sometimes doesn't work well with uh, mm, with a full screen. If I may just keep it like this, can you see the the, the screen? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay. Yes, we can see. So, thank you, thank you. If you do not see well, please tell me. We'll try to move to the uh, to the full screen. But again, there might be some issues. So let's try like this. Um, well, let me just start from from describe describing a bit in details uh what and how russia destroyed uh ukrainian infrastructure not only energy but uh all other infrastructure uh since the beginning of the full scale invasion uh russia has fired more than 6000 missiles on our territory and more than 3000 drones and you know that uh, these uh, attacks continue we expect uh, they will also be very active in uh, winter season because energy sector is one of the targets. Uh, in uh, uh, last winter, uh, we had uh, uh, this is this will be my my second slide. In last winter, we had um, um, several thousands uh, missiles, especially on energy infrastructure. Uh, more than 50% of uh, energy infrastructure was destroyed as a result of the 
uh, of the attack during the last winter, uh, we 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 had damaged several uh, refineries. Our thermal power plants, almost all, had damages, and our companies had to do a lot of restoration during the summer work. Uh, we uh, have one nuclear power plant is which is captured now. And uh, you know that there is an EAEA mission to, uh, constantly monitoring the situation. The problem is that we have mines now at this at the nuclear power plant, and uh, any time we don't know, any time the, the catastrophe can happen there. So this is a huge risk. I would say even nuclear uh, uh, threat for uh, Ukrainian territories and for Ukrainian uh, people who live uh, uh, around the nuclear power plant. Uh, we also have more than 80% uh, of solar and wind uh, generation, which is either captured or destroyed because our um, generation capacity in renewables is located on the south or at the east. Uh, they uh, again, they are either captured or destroyed, which is very hard for Ukraine now to negotiate with new businesses and new investors to invite them to this business. Because you know, when you are a business and you are a potential investor and you see what Russia is doing with wind and solar uh, plants, uh, you you are not sure uh, whether you are ready to step in immediately uh, during the war. A lot of transformers and auto transformers were destroyed. So the strategy of Russia was to destroy the electricity system as much as possible. And they targeted uh, transformers and auto transformers to divide different regions one from each other. So if you have the region which has surplus of electricity generation, okay, it might stay uh, with the electricity supply. But if you have a region which uh, gets this electricity from the neighboring region and it is uh, cut uh, uh, with, uh, with a missile, so this region will be out of the electricity for some period of time. That was a strategy of Russia to divide the regions and leave us without electricity for a long, uh, quite long period of time. But uh, uh, I have to say that, uh, um, again, thanks to our international partners and mostly thankful to Ukrainian uh, energy companies and workers, we, we, did, we didn't have the, let's, let's say, five, year, five days uh, blackouts. The biggest blackouts, the longest blackouts we had uh, in some particular regions or cities were like two or three days. Then uh, the restoration uh, took place. Uh, maybe just to to describe this particular slide that the first, uh, the biggest blackout, first uh, blackout happened in November, and uh, there were uh, missiles which uh, which were tar which targeted Ukrainian energy infrastructure, and uh, this five points uh, explains how this uh, blackouts happened actually and how what what was targeted i will be happy to share the presentation uh, with all the details again uh, this is how ukraine looked uh, from the from the um, uh, space uh, during the blackout you can see that all other countries around have uh, a lot of electricity and light and Ukraine remained totally black. So we really had a systematic and uh, and huge problem with all the electricity system. Uh, again, what we did was the recovery and the restoration. Uh, and again, we we had to do both things. One is to restore electricity system immediately. So after the attack all the companies or ministries everybody actually started with uh, some immediate uh, maintenance and reparation and uh, simultaneously a uh, midterm and long term also started to um, to ensure that in the long term perspective we will have enough capacity um, and backup options so uh, we started to ask for backup power sources and uh, 
Ukrainians started to import a lot of generators. Now, I think we have more than a million additional generators in our country. Um, energy companies asked for different types of equipment, cables, transformers, auto transformers. Um, and the international partners, uh, they provide still provide this uh, to us. Uh, we should have backup options also for this winter. So maybe I will also mention that if... Uh, the Pakistan would like to support Ukraine uh, with any equipment for energy infrastructure that would be most welcome. Uh, there is a list of uh, equipment needed and it can be provided uh, to anybody, to all the institutions who would like to support Ukraine for, for this winter. Uh, also, how we prepare for this winter, we are developing additional air defense systems around the uh, uh, big um, power generation units, so you cannot hide them because they are big. The only issue or the only answer is to have uh, air defense systems around. Of course, it cannot be Patriots, but uh, something smaller, but this is what we are trying to, to discuss with the partners. Then we have engineering protection of energy facilities. Uh, if you If you afraid of drones and drones are a real threat for energy system you have to protect it physically and uh, i cannot share details but uh, this is part of the strategy for for the next uh, for the winter but also for the next years and decades um we also uh as i say we have also uh, we are communicating and negotiating to get as much fuel as possible and again uh, all the support from international partners are more than, than welcome uh, because uh, fuel is something which will be very much needed during the winter period of time as a backup option for, uh, for the generation. Um, maybe I will go to the wider situation, to the wider uh, picture, and we'll explain how the Ukraine-Russia war impacted on energy uh pol politics uh, situation in european union you remember that russia started to blackmail european union not in 2022 but in 2021 so they started to uh limit gas supply to the european union countries and the first half of 2021 eu countries especially germany they didn't believe that this is in purpose they always thought that okay maybe something technical issues or something like this. But uh, when uh, Gazprom didn't fill gas storages in uh, August 2021 in Germany, uh, it raised uh, a lot of questions inside the EU. And they understood that this part of the strategy uh, to prepare for the uh, war, but also to blackmail European Union with uh, Nord Stream 2, uh, this new pipe, the pipeline which Russia built and wanted to start operating in October 2021. Uh, that's how the story between European Union and Russia started in, in gas sphere, the fight, I would even say. So the answer of the European Union on Russian blackmail was not to agree on the blackmailing strategy, but to respond. And they have developed so-called Repower EU plan, uh, which means that the European Union should decrease its dependency from all types of Russian fuel, from gas, from oil, from coal, from everything. So um, uh, the, the plan actually is still in force. European Union still uh, is dependent on some of the uh, Russian fuel, especially on gas, but, not, uh, but it moved from the gas pipeline to LNG. Uh, import from Russia. Um, we think, and uh, my think tank as well is part of the coalition, broader international coalition, which negotiates with the EU countries to uh, move forward with uh, independence or less dependency from Russian fuel. Uh, we do hope that it will happen still quite soon, that the Russian LNG share will further decrease, but also in the electricity sector, in, I mean, in the nuclear sector, uh, Russia will not uh, be able to build or supply uh, nuclear fuel uh, for uh, nuclear power plants, which are built uh, in the European Union. 
maybe to connect this issue with the broader issues, I would say that um, Russian com uh, national company Rosatom, which is a nuclear power plant, a nuclear company, uh, they they their strategy uh, is uh, not to supply or to build dependency uh, of the EU countries from from Russia, but also they have wanted to duplicate such such strategy in third countries. Uh, Russia is trying to build nuclear power plants. In South Africa, they already built nuclear power plant in Turkey. Uh, they are negotiating with Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and other countries around the world. So the goal is very pretty similar as uh, as with gas dependency. If you build a nuclear power plant and you supply uh, this nuclear power plant with Russian uh, fuel, you uh, sort of make this country dependent on the electricity generation from, from this uh, particular nuclear unit. And uh, in that case, uh, we just encourage to look what is happening with our Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. If it's captured and Russia literally blackmail us with a potential nuclear uh, catastrophe or disaster, um, it's quite a lesson learned from, I would say, all the third countries who want to build uh, Russian uh, nuclear power plants with Russian reactors and Russian uh, fuel. Uh, on Central Asia, I would say that uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and other countries, they have to, they, they definitely supported Ukraine officially and we are we're very much thankful for, for this position. We understand that this country is still very much dependent from many uh, uh, economic relations with Russia, including in energy sector, in oils uh, field in particular. We do see that Gazprom started to fight uh, for the influence in this region. While they are losing the influence in European Union, they started to fight to increase its influence in Central Asia. Uh, I mean that uh, Gazprom is now in and Russia is now, is now trying to negotiate to build a um, consortium to uh, with uh, um, Kazakh, Uzbek, Uz Uzbek, and uh, other countries in gas sector to supply more gas to China and to other countries in this region. Um, again, uh, we just encourage all these countries to take a lessons learned from Ukraine. We had very similar scenarios in 2009 and in 2013, and happy to uh, to share our experience how we avoided uh, this uh, dependency. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, again, uh, we are very much thankful for the support uh, at the UN General Assembly. Uh, we understand that uh, these particular countries also feel the, uh, the fluctuation on energy markets uh, in terms of prices from the war between Ukraine and Russia. But what we really would like to encourage and ask for is to try to support Ukraine with more openness, opening of the of the energy markets, especially in oil sector, because it is not a secret that Russia is using as, as many possibilities as possible to avoid sanctions in the uh, uh, oil sector and in gas sector. And all the scenarios, all the um, scenarios with blended oil, or uh, uh, selling oil on, with the different flags uh, on the ships. Uh, this is still in place. And it's really hard to fight with Russia if you have, uh, on the one hand, you have uh, countries who are ready to totally refuse from Russian oil and force Russia to uh, deal with its own economic situation and stop the war. Uh, but on the other side, you have countries who would like to benefit from this and just increase the cooperation with Russia with some hidden uh, schemes. That's unfortunately just continue the war and make the situation worse, including for, for everybody, for all countries in the world. Um, just to show you this fluctuation uh, in, in energy uh, on energy prices, uh, it's still continuous. And if, uh, if we will move forward with further decrease of price caps on Russian gas 
in the future, I think the fluctuation also will uh, take place. But again, this is a question of timing. We can continue this uh, uh, games and schemes in the oil sector, but then it will just make the war longer with further impact on all other economic sectors, or we will make uh, some fair decisions. Uh, it might be some problems at the and the energy markets in the short term but then we will finish the more serious and more strategic uh issue uh, with the gas prices i have to say that it's a bit uh, uh, less problematic i just saw the um the statistics uh, of uh, price uh, in europe on gas which is europe is uh, actually still a bit dependent from russian gas but not so much so even if you decide now to uh, fully refused from Russian gas, it will not have so big impact uh, on the prices on gas as it was in 2021. Um, just a few words on sanctions. Uh, uh, I already told about this. Uh, there were different types of sanctions on Russia, price caps in oil and uh, in, in oil products. Uh, we have a, a ban from the EU on uh, uh, gas import by pipelines, but not for all the countries. But still, I think uh, they will move forward with a ban for all countries. And uh, we are discuss the EU is now discussing the 12th package of sanctions. And we are very much encouraging them to uh, increase or widen the package to the nuclear sector because uh, Russia atom is now benefiting from from uh, from the situations. Uh, I see uh, from as, as far as I know, they even increased uh, their profit uh, in 2022. Um, as I say, the Russia will still try to use energy as a power tool uh, to influence the global markets. Uh, but again, if we are not ready to uh, use this tool to stop Russia, we will have to deal with much more serious problems, including the food crisis, which was described before, uh, for for a long period of time. We we have to make uh, painful but uh, but a decision. Um, and uh, some of our recommendations on how we can move uh, with uh, sanctions uh, pressure. Uh, we'll be happy again to share it uh, with you for the future. And uh, we would be very much thankful if, uh, if Pakistan could also consider supporting Ukraine on increasing sanctions, on uh, making more transparent uh, oil markets, and not to trade with uh, Russia in all possible spheres. And also, if you can support us with... Uh, winter preparation season to be able to survive this winter, we also would be very, very much thankful. Thank you very much and uh, happy to answer the question. Thank you, Dr. Elena, for such an in-depth analysis for perspectives from Pakistan. I invite Dr. Ashfaq Hassan Khan, Principal of School of Social Sciences and Humanities, Nas Islamabad and Director General, Nas Institute of Policy Studies, NIPS. He has also been appointed as a member of the Advisory Council of the Asian Development Bank. Dr. Ashfaq, please. Thank you. Do we have Dr. Ashfaq with us? Am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I'm audible now? Yes, sir. sir. Okay, okay. So let me thank first the Institute of Pre for giving me this opportunity uh, to share my thoughts on the Russian Ukrainian war and basically impact on energy security. Uh, I would like to say that I have written a book which came out uh, only this year, in the beginning of this year, under the title of Russia-Ukraine War or Russia-Ukraine Crisis, Dawn of a New World Order with a question mark. It is already published, uh, which I covered extensively, whatever we, we are discussing here today. And I am in the process of uh, further updating that 
uh, book, uh, the second edition, maybe at the end of this year, uh, I will publish the second edition. What is important is that the war is still going on. And within this period of war, I think the first edition and the second edition of the book hopefully will come out. Uh, as we all know that uh, Russia invasion of Ukraine on February 24, 22, it was a monumental change in geopolitics and geoeconomics. I'm not going to go into the, the, the detail, but I will concentrate only on energy. Unprecedented, such a wide ranging economic sanctions were imposed on Russia, never witnessed in the history of the mankind. I will be concentrating on energy. Is this sanction is working? The main purpose of this sanction, particularly energy, was that to create uh, economic dislocation, uh, dry down the resources that the Russia is uh, uh, earning from its exports of natural gas and oil and coal uh, to finance this war. Basically, the idea was to weaken Russia to the, to the extent that it never dared to undertake such exercise, such invasion again in any part of the Europe. Is it working? I think we are on 18th month in the war. Has this sanction on energy or any other areas, has it stopped the war? Or is it, the war is still going on with even greater intensity? So the, the question is that, is sanction working? My gut feeling is that uh, sanction in such an integrated world, history shows that it hasn't worked. Iran has been under sanction for 43 years, not less than Russia. Has Iran wiped out from the, uh, from the community of the nation? Iran has emerged as a very powerful country, producing drones, and that drones are being used against our brother and sister in, Iran, in Ukraine. So does that make any difference, this economic sanction? So history has suggested that economic sanction has not worked and it is not going to work because the world is highly integrated with each other. We are not living in an island. Having said this, the other important thing to note is that when a country is so rich in natural resources, do you think that sanction will work? Because the world is dependent on their natural resources. So they will, the world will find out some way here and there to get those resources, to run their own machines, to run their own economies. The proven reserves of natural gas of Russia is about 49 trillion cubic meter feet, cubic feet, uh, sorry, cubic meter, which is about 24%, one fourth of the world proven reserve of natural gas is in Russia. Do you think that the sanction will work? Russia is exporting, is the single largest exporter in the world in terms of gas, 200 billion cubic meter. It is exporting 160, it has a proven reserve of 160 billion tons of coal. And similarly, which is about 15% of the world. It is the largest natural gas exporter in the world. Russia is the largest natural gas exporter in the world. Second largest crude oil exporter after Saudi Arabia. Third largest exporter of coal after Indonesia and Australia. Do you think that sanction in such a resource rich country is going to make any difference? Now, if you look at the, I'm giving you each energy-wise breakdown, crude oil 
49% goes to Europe. Whatever Russia produces, 49% goes to Europe and 30% goes to Asia and Oceania and 13% to the rest of the world. So almost half of oil goes to Europe. Similarly, in terms of natural gas, three-fourths of natural gas goes to Europe, 13% each to Asia and the rest of the world. If you look at the coal, bulk of coal, 53%, more than half of coal is exported to Asia and 32%, one third to Europe and 15% to the rest of the world. So look at the dependence of the, world, uh, of the world on Russia's energy. Let me break down the crude oil export. Russia produced 10.5 million barrels per day in 2022. Sorry, 2021. Half of them, that is 49% was exported. So they produce 10.5 million, they kept for their own use purpose, for domestic purpose, and then almost one half was exported. And out of that one half, which is about 4.7 million barrel, one half went to Europe, 2.4 million barrel. And 38%, which is 1.8 million or approximately 2 billion to Asia, and 0.6 million or 13%, to the rest of the world. So this is regarding oil. In, in other words, half of Russia's export of oil went to, uh, uh, to Europe. Let me come back to natural gas. Russia produced close to 25 trillion cubic feet of gas, of which 8.9 million, uh, 9 trillion, roughly 36% were exported and rest were used for their own purpose. Out of that, 84% of Russia's natural gas is uh, piped gas and only 16% is LNG. Europe was the largest market of Russian natural gas and accounting for three-fourths of Russia's export of natural gas to Europe. Three-fourths. The remaining 26% uh, in Asia and the rest of the world. As far as coal is concerned, Russia exported 262 million tons of coal in 2021. 53% Russian coal went to Asia and 33% to Europe. Now, how dependent, how dependent is Europe on Russian energy? This is the question that we are seeing. And this will give you an idea. Europe has been heavily dependent on, Russian, on Russia for its energy requirement. Decades of dependence, not one, two, decades of dependence on Russian piped gas and oil cannot be replaced through alternative sources in short to medium term. It will take time. And this transition period, which can be three years to five years to even 10 years, Europe will have to pay the price and the rest of the world will have to pay the price. Last year, Europe had the opportunity to pile up gas requirement for their winter. They imported all from, from the Russia as well as from all over the world. Just to build up their uh, stockpile the gas that can be used uh, in, uh, in winter, uh, because in winter, some 30% more gas requirement takes place. So in order to handle that uh, coming winter, they did that and very successfully, they managed the winter. What will happen to this winter? And I think if, uh, our friend from Russia, from Dixie Group, she also alluded to this. What will happen to this winter? Where would the Europe will find gas from the rest of the world? This will be a serious challenge. Now, if you look at the oil, dependence on oil, Germany is dependent to 30% of its requirement to Europe. 30% German. One third is of oil requirement is from Europe. 
from Russia. France, 13%. Italy, 1-3, 13%. But look at Finland, 80% dependence on oil of Finland on Russia. Where would Finland go to uh, uh, cover this 80% requirement? Hungary, 43%. Lithuania, 83%. Poland, 58%. Slovakia, 74%, and so on. They are heavily dependent on Russian oil. In order to beat this global shortages, United States released from their stock, strategic stock, more than 120 million barrels of oil. And in this process, their stockpile, the strategic reserve, has fallen down from over one year to, I think, 40 days now. And there is a serious issue in, in the United States these days. That their strategic reserve has fallen down from, for, they, they had a strategic reserve to cater their own market for one year. And they built, started building up after the 1973-74 oil shock. And their strategic reserve is continuously falling. Now, in terms of gas, overall, 40% European gas is coming from Russia. But within Europe, there are countries which are heavily dependent on Russian gas. For example, Germany, 43% German requirement is piped gas from uh, from Germany uh, from Russia. Italy is dependent to the extent of 46%. And there are countries who are dependent by 100%, like North Macedonia, Bosnia Herzegovina, Moldova, Finland 90%, Latvia 90%, Bulgaria 90%, Serbia 89%. Where would they go for this alternative sources of uh, gas other than Russia? You know, we have to look into these things uh, very closely. Similarly, for Russian gas uh, 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 as a substitute, United States is a substitute, it started selling LNG and at the price five times more than the price they used to get from Russia five times and you may have noticed that the French prime president has complained to the United States that you are taking benefit of our problems. So alternative is very difficult sir in the short to medium term. Secondly, Europe is dependent on piped gas. So their entire infrastructure is built up accordingly looking into the piped gas infrastructure so invested in it and alternative is lng where is the lng terminal are they connected to the, to the pipelines also it will take time much longer time to reduce the dependence from the russian energy saying is everything is fine you know, i can uh, i can share uh, 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 my friends from yes, dixie so group she was explaining I think she explained very beautifully. But you see, saying is something else and doing practical things is a, is a difficult. Prashpak, may I politely intervene and remind you that we are uh, running a little bit short in time. If you could kindly grab this in a few minutes. I, I, I'll Thank take two, so two, more minutes. Two, two more minutes. Only. Yes, two more minutes only. Yes, of course. Yes. Of course. Alternative market. Russia has, in the process has also tried to find out the alternative market. As we all know, India, and China has bailed out as far as oil is concerned. They have more than compensated to the, uh, to the, to the sale which used to go to, uh, to Europe. More than 2.4 million barrel which used to go to the Europe. It has, more, it has been more than compensated by Russia, uh, sorry, by China and India. Nobody is talking about India. No one has said about India is bailing out Russia in this war. Everybody has kept quiet. As far as gas is concerned, the no limit friend China is bailing out through power of Siberian one pipeline and power of Siberian two pipeline. Then 
As I said, it will take much longer time, to short to medium term, to reduce the dependence of Europe from uh, Russian energy. In the meantime, this time period, the Russia will also try to find their own market, and they are doing that. So naturally, they will also find out the market. Now, let me close down by saying that it has created serious problem. Not only talk to the people in Germany, look at their economies, what is happening. German economy is in, almost in recession, slowing down. People are losing jobs. Higher energy prices causing inflation. Interest rate is high, slowing down the economic activity. Germany is the, is the largest economy of Europe, contributing 25% to your European Union budget. If that European economy, Germany is facing problem, the Europe as a whole will be facing problem. Similarly, we are also facing the problem. The oil prices have gone up. What happened to Saudi Arabia and, your, uh, and, and UAE? They did not cooperate with the United States in increasing the uh, supply of oil. In fact, they have cut down the, uh, by 1.3 million barrels per day. So the, the prices of oil will be rising. It will be going more than $100 per barrel going forward. And this will have implications for Pakistan as a developing country. We are dependent on imported oil. So, sir, concluding remarks is that history has shown that economic sanctions has never achieved the intended objectives. There cannot be absolute satisfaction among the warring faction. There cannot be an absolute satisfaction among the warring faction. We have to rely on balanced dissatisfaction. Balanced dissatisfaction. This war has to stop because war is no solution. It has to, it has, it has to be stopped. And as I stated, there cannot be a winner and there cannot be a loser. You cannot, there cannot be an absolute satisfaction. You have to rely and live with balanced dissatisfaction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ashfaq, for your very insightful remarks. Uh, with this, we move to the question and answer session. Uh, we have a question from uh, a researcher at IPRI, uh, Ikra Siddiqui. She is asking Dr. Farah Nas, we do not see the war ending in the near future. So what could be the possible ways out of the issue facing Ukraine regarding food shortage, uh, trade routes, and repeated loading and unloading of cranes? Dr. Farah Nas. Thank you very much. A very good question. Uh, well, I think one way or the other, if we are so um, after, you know, resolving the food security problems in the world today, and we are so concerned about the developing countries, we have to come forward and ask for ending the war because end of the war is solution to all the problems. Otherwise, these loading, reloading, routes, sea routes, closure, trade routes, all of them cannot sustain the way they should. So end of the war is solution to the problem, but alternatively, we have to find some kind of diplomatic resolve. And that is only possible if we can go with some kind of solution, like we tried through the Turkey, but what happened towards the end, it never materialized. So we know even the diplomatic solutions are not um, capable enough fully to resolve it. So we have to bring the parties concerned and we have to request a world powerful country, United States of America, to come forward and to try to, to to protect the countries, the developing world who are going through lots of food security issues. And the, the role of the United Nations, IMF, World Bank becomes very crucial over here because they themselves are crying over that they're not able to provide supplies to the to the to all the affected people in the world who are going through famine, droughts, or through other means of conflict in their in their countries. So they have to come forward and find a solution to the war. Otherwise, without a solution to the war, the, the food security and the energy security prices, they're going to go more and, and higher in the future as well. Thank you for being very insightful and being very brief. Uh, we would encourage the respondents in future to be mindful of the time constraint. We're already jumping a little bit. Uh, we have a question from Captain Janet. 
who's asking, uh, what role have international sanctions played in exacerbating or mitigating food security challenges in Russia and Ukraine during the conflict and how these measures affect global food markets? Perhaps uh, Dr. Maria may, may respond okay. to this. Dr. Ishfaq has already answered this question. Yes, okay. So if anyone else wants to add to this or we, maybe we can move to the next question. Yes. Uh, miss, can we ask, because we have been listening uh, you know, for hours, so we deserve to ask. Uh, mm -hmm. We deserve Absolutely. a chance to ask some questions. Well, is it to Samia? The, uh, the voice is made. Okay. Can you hear me? Introduce yourself first, yes, please yes. go ahead. Okay, my name is Abdul Sattar, and I'm just a working journalist, and uh, I'm sorry to say the session sounds to me a bit Russian based, uh, bashing, except Dr. Ashfaq Ahmed Khan, who pointed out uh, some important facts. I think uh, when it comes to this Ukraine, uh, uh, Ukraine war or the Russian invasion, that must be condemned. There is no doubt about that. Every war is bad. But on the other hand, uh, we need to see uh, Russia may be paranoid, but we need to see that paranoia from uh, Polish Lithuania Commonwealth to the Napoleon's attack to the attack of Hitler. Russia was invaded twice uh, from uh, from its western border. So being paranoid is not illogical. Then uh, James Baker and other American officials did hold uh, hold out you know assurances at the time of the demise of the soviet union that not a single inch of nato uh, eastward expansion would be carried out and now we see that uh, central europe eastern europe baltic states and you are uh, nato is more or less 400 or 600 kilometers from moscow so no country in the world, let alone the biggest power uh, on earth, would tolerate any hostile power in its backyard. Pakistan cannot tolerate a, a, a hostile government in Afghanistan. India would not do that in Nepal or Bhutan. Iran would not do that. They are not as big power as Russia. Why would Russia, I mean, tolerate any, any hostile power? The biggest question is the dismantling of this biggest war machine on earth that is called NATO that has been attacking country, uh, destroying countries, creating wars and triggering wars. So I think that is very, that is, yes, that, that is very interesting. That is very appreciative that you uh, shared your uh, statement rather than a question. Uh, as I have already politely mentioned, we are a bit short of time and we would like to focus on the questions we have heard you. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, for the next uh, question, I think we've already had a very animated session in the chat box uh, where our uh, kind speakers have been engaging quite uh, leisurely on the questions, but I would still like to again mention the question uh, raised by our economic chair, Dr. Salman. He's asking, considering the potential shift in the production possibility frontier, PPF, for affected nations, we can we trace the disturbances in capital and commodities markets back to the specific disruptions in the Russia-Ukraine supply chain? So if any of the speakers would like to comment further on this, we've had a little bit of a debate on this in the chat box already, but we're open for more insights. <clears throat> All right, let's move to the next question. Again, this was by Captain Junaid. Uh, can historical examples of conflict similar to Russia, Ukraine, provide insights into potential strategies for addressing food security concerns in the region and preventing future crises? Good question. Uh, if, if I may, so I replied to this question in the chat. I don't think so. I don't think that there are historical examples because the level of their interdependency is so high right now. And uh, the, uh, this is the first conflict when the member of permanent member of uh, uh, United Nations Security Council and the nuclear power attacked uh, its neighbor, uh, meaning Russia attacked Ukraine, and that uh, Russia effectively uh, bans and blocks any, and I stress here, any efficient measure from the United Nations to tackle this problem. Uh, they even intimidated United Nations into this uh, kind of initiative. Uh, so they tried to intimidate United Nations uh, and blackmailed United Nations that 
you should release uh, the Russian banks from sanctions, and then we will allow Ukraine uh, grain to be exported. So from this point of view, the international platforms appear to be inefficient, and a lot depends on the uh, ad hoc coalitions of the countries on a bilateral, uh, on a bilateral level and on a multilateral level that uh, can resolve this issue. So therefore, the same uh, the initiatives like grain from Ukraine can uh, help. But on the multilateral level, unfortunately, Russia has blocked everything. A point well made, can sir. I, Thank can, you. I, can, I, can, can I add um, Absolutely, please. You see, if you look at uh, uh, the agreement which was uh, done earlier between United Nations, Turkey and uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine on the one hand about the grain exports, you see the solution is that let Ukraine be allowed to export their grain to wherever they want. Let Russia wants to export grain or fertilizer to anywhere they want. So there should not be this grain or fertilizer, the food should not be part of sanction. And this food, is what the, the food is not part of the sanctions. Yes, exactly. That this is, is what I'm coming. I know that. I know that. This is what the European Union, the lady, has also said the same thing. But you see, when, you, when I export to country A or country B, how could my account be settled? So there is a, a restrictions on the transfer of, of, of money from SWIFT. The banks are under sanction. The trade, the trade payments cannot be settled. This is but what the are saying. Okay, but how you can uh, export if your ports are uh, bombarded by the missiles? So yes. this is the, how, exactly. how so here here we so should once agree. you agree see no, here once, we agree. once it is the agreed that on the banks can be lifted oh. if Russia stops missile attacks this is clear if let Russia me, doesn't let, stop missiles attacks let me say I, 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 I'm not holding any brief from Russian because I, I have never visited that place see what I'm saying as a professional economist that if you allow food grain to be exported by country A and country B, how this account be settled? Once it is agreed that yes, there will be no ban as far as uh, 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 money transfer from SWIFT or any other sources to my account, if it is, it is, it is assured that there will be no sanction uh, on this transfer of my money, then of course there will be no need to put a bar on uh, on on, on, on uh, Black Sea or Russian uh, or Ukraine export uh, of grain to to the rest of the world, well, because the fine. world is not allowing the world is not allowing to get the payment settled through SWIFT account. This is what everybody everybody is asking. Point well, received, Doctor It will be a result. Point received with thanks. Uh, I suppose we had a, a raise of hands uh, by Alexi Haran from DIF. If we can have them. Thank we you. Th yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And also professor of Kiev Mohil Academy. Actually, I wanted to respond to previous question, but now when we started to talk about the situation with grain expert, uh, the question to Mr. Khan, Hassan Khan, is who is responsible for this situation? Who is responsible for this great grain crisis? Ukraine, the West, or Russian aggression? But now let me come back to the question which was put forward by Mr. by journalist, and actually I do not see his face. And the name, the name is Samia, right? Am I correct? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think that here there are specialists and we know very well what has happened with Russia, with Russian attack against Ukraine. But uh, I assume that our record would see some people who are not familiar with history. So very, very brief, briefly, Mr. Samia, in 2014, when Russia attacked Ukraine, Ukraine was a neutral country. Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons. And Russia guaranteed its territorial integrity. And Ukrainians didn't want to join NATO at all. We wanted to be a neutral country and we were proclaimed 
as neutral country. So the question is, who should be concerned about security, Russia or Ukraine? Imagine, just extrapolate this situation to your own country. If Pakistan is giving up nuclear weapons, proclaim itself neutral, and your security is guaranteed by your nuclear neighbors, and then you are attacked, who is to be blamed for that? I would stop here. Thank you very much. Sir, just it's it important to know. It was not, uh, but please. Just a minute, just a minute. Let me, let me say, I highly respect your views, Professor. I highly respect your views. For you, the war started in 2014. Correct. In this book, in this book, the war has started after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And this is what the journalist uh, uh, was alluding okay. to, right? This is the, this is the book which I have just Sir. published. Sir, I am giving you the fact. Everything. I am giving you the fact. The war did not start in 2014. No, no, no. The Excuse war started me. in 19 Excuse after me. the fall First of the Berlin Sweden, Wall. Denmark, Norway, Norway. Excuse me. I am giving, I am giving one more friend, one more phrase. I am giving hard facts. We were neutral. We were, we didn't want to join NATO. We gave up nuclear weapons and we were attacked by a nuclear country, which guaranteed our territorial integrity. Hard fact, full stop. Thanks a lot. Shukriya. Thank you so much. It's, it's a very sensitive topic. Uh, Thank you uh, so much to all the participants for such an engaging session. We now move to President Ipri, Ambassador Zah Mohammed, uh, so that he could share his vote of thanks for such insightful discourse today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished speakers and, uh, from uh, Ukraine and uh, from Pakistan, it's, it was a great honor for me to welcome you here and listen to you. I think having difference of opinion is not a bad thing. Uh, we can have different opinions, but that does not mean that uh, uh, who is uh, we can decide that who is right, who is wrong. Uh, everyone have their own process of thinking, their own arguments, and it is good that we should accommodate all the uh, people. We should listen to the differences. We should listen to the supportive arguments, and this is what has happened today. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, your questions for your answers and for the speakers who have very patiently uh, heard, spoken, and uh, candidly answered. In the conclusion, I would like to say just two things. Number one, the complex interdependence has been established very well during past about two years of Russia-Ukraine war. Whether you like it or you don't like it, but the world is more integrated, more interdependent, and especially when it comes to oil and food, it is a need actually of everyone and every country. And that is what, have, what we have seen during this war, that it is not that the uh, American um, influence has eroded, but it is need of the people that they are not abiding by all the sanctions. Similarly, when it came to the vote in United Nations, a few countries abstained, and these are those countries which are very close to United States of America, very close to both the countries. Uh, uh, Dr. Ishfaq gave an example of um, India. Yes, India is the closest ally in this region for the United States. They are strategic partner, they are partner, they are bulwark, they are Portuguese or whatever you call it, a regional policeman to counter the Chinese rise. So they are the one in this whole world. I think they and followed by China, perhaps, or uh, China is leading and they are following. They are importing, uh, importing oil and at a much lesser, lesser cost. So it is not the geostrategy only. Actually, it is the food and oil which forces people, and that is how the sanctions are not working that well. But what does it mean? Does it mean that we should continue with the war? Does it mean we should uh, loosen the sanctions? Does it mean that we should abrogate all the sanctions? No. I think the wisest way would be that the, all the wars ultimately end at the negotiating table. 
sooner or later uh, russia and ukraine will have to negotiate whether it is united states and russia or in the united nation or wherever but this situation is not going to last long in the best interest of the people of both the countries and who is most affected i would say it's not the bigger power which are transatlantic powers it is the europe which is affected it is russia which is affected it's a cost of war cost of uh, human catastrophe cost of the environmental catastrophe it is being faced by europe and russia and everyone here they are bearing all the cost and this is where we must think about with this uh, brief conclusion i thank you all and very grateful <laughs>